I'm, uh, I'm Ian Fletcher. I'm a uh, uh, Director of Policy at the British Property Federation and your, your chair for today. I suppose one of the traps of uh, my job on policy is uh, that you can look at issues in the abstract and forget that uh, they impact on real people and real businesses. Uh, we had therefore wanted to look beyond palace policy to the practical implementation of what is coming with the new building safety regime. And uh, I hope we've got uh, um, a very informative uh, webinar for you today. Uh, so, so, so welcome uh, to this webinar and uh, our building safety series, uh, The Works. Um, I'm delighted to say uh, we are bringing this series of events to you in partnership with ARC. Uh, over the coming months, uh, we hope to bring you uh, six events uh, with a deep dive into several aspects of the, the new building safety regime. Today's event um, will run for one hour um, and we'd entitled it uh, Getting Ahead of the New Safety uh, Regulatory Regime by Exploiting Technology. Um, for people who know me, tech technology, not my strong point. Um, I'm delighted to have experts in the room on, on that aspect who are going to, going to introduce in a moment. Uh, ARC um, uh, have been working with organisations in the property sector for nearly 30 years and I know are used by several of our members um, for their safety management on some of the most uh, complex property portfolios in the country. Uh, my, my first experience of them was at uh, uh, the Resi Convention um, at uh, Celtic Man Manor back in 2019. Uh, I think when attentions were just starting to turn to the future building safety regime as, as set out by uh, Dame Judith Hackett and uh, our arc were ahead of the curve in hosting an event at Resi, um, possibly the only building safety event, I think, at that, that uh, convention um, in 2019. Uh, and uh, I was impressed by their knowledge and uh, uh, also by the fact that they decided at that event to, to focus on uh, tenant engagement, um, which I think is, is often a uh, forgotten part of um, this uh, uh, new regime that's been put in place, but a, a vitally important one. Uh, the host that day was um, David Hills, um, who is one of our speakers today, I'm, I'm delighted to say. Uh, David is um, ARC's uh, senior director and one of their experienced safety experts. Uh, his, uh, his bio says he's been solving problems and creating solutions for ARC's clients for over 20 years. Um, uh, so. Uh, no, no, no better person really to invite to this webinar. Um, the other speaker today is a, a newer acquaintance to me, but uh, no less uh, important for that. Um, as Rosalind is a founder of ARC, um, she started the company to support safety management in property and uh, brings all of her um, 30 plus years of experience of working with our sector to uh, today's presentation. A uh, few housekeeping instructions for me. Um, firstly, we are um, very keen to encourage questions. Um, I think timings might be quite tight today. So um, if we don't have a, an opportunity to answer those uh, in, in the webinar itself, uh, then, then we will um, answer all of them um, and record them and come back to, to uh, those that had asked them um, after the event. Um, in that regard, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. Um, I think the functionality of Zoom means that um, questions that are put in the Q&A function are captured, um, but uh, the chat is, is lost after the event. Um, I should say that we will also record the event and make you aware, everybody that's here today, as to um, when that is available um, so that you can review at your leisure. Uh, so secondly, uh, we'd like to do a poll later on in the event just to gain some ideas um, of prioritisation from you as to you know, what, what you'd like to see next um, in the series. Um, so I'd encourage you, please cast your votes um, when, when we put up that poll. Uh, <laughs> and finally, just to say from me that um, yeah, at the BPF, we have a, a building safety sounding board. Um, I'm grateful to its members for their support um, over the last couple of years and what is a, an exceptionally complex area of policy and practice. Uh, particular shout out to uh, Marcus Phillips and Julie Webb as the, the chair and 
vice chair of our sounding board. I'd say it's a very open group. Um, yeah, they, they do a lot of sharing of, of best practice and uh, uh, any BPF member who wanted to get involved in that sounding board's work um, only need to uh, get in touch with myself, uh, Ian, or my colleague, um, Sam, Sam Benstead. Uh, so, so, so without further ado, uh, as I said at the start, I, I'm, I'm delighted to be working in partnership with ARC on, on, on this series. And uh, uh, I think uh, Rosalind Benjamin, the CEO, is going to uh, introduce uh, the presentation. Thank you, Ian. Um, the introduction of the Building Safety Bill presents us all with one of the most disruptive periods in residential property management for decades, and is a unique challenge that will need support and coordination that only technology will be able to deliver. Today, you will see that that is much more than just digitizing the golden thread. And David is going to take us through the key aspects of the bill and how technology overall has been overlooked by many, the new roles of accountable persons and building safety managers, and how technology is probably the only way to manage the huge volumes of data and coordination that's going to be involved. And of course, then the golden thread and how that will need to be shared with varying forms of numbers of audiences. Over to you, David. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, today my intention is to take you through why technology will play a pivotal role in the new building safety regime. We're looking specifically at the, the various roles and new roles that are actually included within that regime, about getting ahead of what we believe is going to be the May 2023 uh, deadline, um, or at least that's where we're expecting the commencement to look at the entire building safety ecosystem. I don't just want to focus on on the golden thread. I know there's a huge amount of information, a huge amount of interest in what the golden thread is and, and uh, how it affects various people. But I don't just want to focus on that. I want to look very specifically at how we exploit technology to improve what we would like to call the pathways to compliance. So I think first things first, Rosalind's right. It's a, a huge change to the regulatory regime. Um, according to the government, uh, it's going to be one of the most significant changes in decades, and it's going to actually introduce a new era of accountability. Um, May 2023, as I said, is when we are expecting the commencement of the bill. That, of course, could change. But we've been told uh, and most of us have heard this, that the government have been advising all of us, building owners, anybody else who's been supporting them, as well as the construction industry as well, that they need to move on this now. They need to move on building safety now before legislation has actually been caught up. Or we've gone through that particular processes. So we've, we know that changes are already needed within the system. In addition to that, the government have made it very, very clear, haven't they? There's no excuse. Industry must act now, they have told us. So what I would suggest from my understanding of, of talking to uh, a number of those within what was the MHCLG of the new department of levelling up is that don't expect too much time or much leeway when it comes to the implementation of the act. Um, get on and do it now is what they've effectively said. I think the very important element as well is that 18 months may sound like a, a, a huge amount of time, but actually it's very little time left to create those pathways to compliance. And I think we need to start thinking about certain aspects now rather than leaving them for whenever the act is going to be actually passed, which we believe could be around about October. We already know that actually some of the actual requirements within the actual bill mean that if you are not ready in time, then you may not actually have effectively a license to trade or a license to occupy your premises. There are, of course, moral and corporate social responsibility uh, obligations that we've all got to think about. We cannot afford another Grenfell. The industry has been told, we have been told that we are ignorant. We've been told that we are indifferent. We cannot afford as an industry to allow another Grenfell to actually occur. So there are certain moral and corporate social responsibility obligations that we've all got to think about. And I think in respect of that, we've all got to think about how this actually sits within the court of public opinion. 
So with, with that in mind, what I want to do is take you through now the, the various elements of the Act and where technology fits in. Um, we took one look at the Act uh, when it was in its draft form uh, as it was going through some statutory inspection. Obviously, it's now going through its parliamentary processes at the moment. And at the time, it was 119 uh, sections. It's now 130 odd sections with nine schedules. We decided actually that was just way too difficult to actually get to grips with. So we broke the actual bill down and looked very specifically at the key areas. But I think first things first, what are the buildings that are in scope? We know that, for example, any building that contains two or more dwellings or two or more rooms for residential purposes or excuse me, uh, any student accommodation is going to be covered. And then, of course, we've got the height condition as well. And that height condition at the moment, and again, this is obviously subject to change and has been changed. Uh, that four floor surface has got to be um, at the top of uppermost floor surface has got to be 18 meters or more above the ground or a building that contains more than seven stories. So looking at that, if you take the current belief um, in respect of the numbers and the scale of which we've we've got within the whole of uh, England and Wales is that we believe at the moment buildings um, above 18 metres is around about 13,000 and buildings between 11 and 18 metres is around about 80,000. Why have I mentioned 18 metres or 11 metres, sorry? Very, very simply is that we already know that the Bill allows the uh, Secretary of State to make changes if he so, so thinks. Um, and we've already seen the fact that in Wales, they are looking at perhaps a slightly different approach and may actually be looking at 11 metres as, an, as, a, as a de minimis. So if that's brought down, then we could be looking at around about 80,000 properties that are actually going to be in scope. What I would say, as I, as I said, though, is that scope and the extent of what the bill covers is subject to change. And the Secretary of State has been given effectively within that bill the ability to make changes even at a later date. So whilst the bill may actually come out as it stands at the moment, 18 metres, seven storeys, that could change at a later date as well. So. What do we know about the, the bill? Uh, well, obviously, the bill has come out of the independent review undertaken by Dame Judith Hackett. And, and we've heard a lot, haven't we, all of us, that we've, we've got a brand new regulator. Uh, that regulator, uh, certainly in England, is going to be through the HSE. We believe Wales are looking at a slightly different approach to that at the moment. We also know that uh, in respect of the design and build and construction management arrangements, We've effectively got a new three gateway approach that, that is in place and or is already being enforced in certain areas. We've obviously got new roles and accountabilities. We've got the new accountable person and principal accountable person. And in, this, in addition to that, we've got new roles such as the building safety manager. And there's been a huge amount of concern and, and press coverage about those particular areas. Perhaps the biggest area that, that's been, been heard about is that need to maintain and, and gather that golden thread of information that Dame Judith highlighted within her report. And obviously all of that produces or enables the accountable person to produce what we call a safety case. Now, again, we've got some new guidance that's been issued by the HSC on the safety case. So that again is quite well known in the industry already. And as I said, that building safety manager role is going to be that provision for ongoing building safety management. As Ian alluded to earlier, um, we certainly picked up very early on that there's actually a need to give residents a voice. Um, that's been one of the major issues that Dame Judith Hackett um, highlighted that was of a major concern within her report. And obviously, in addition to that, the bill has added in some additional elements on, on how this is going to be managed through the Landlord and Tenant Act. And we've obviously got the new building safety charge that actually forces uh, accountable persons to set aside um, funds for building safety um, and make it a much more transparent approach for the residents and others. 
A lot there is very, very well known. But I think for us at ARC, one of the major concerns that we have is that there doesn't seem to be much talk about technology. Um, one of the elements certainly that we see as a major problem within the industry is that technology has been put aside. When you actually look at though, at the Hackett report, she's made two very, very clear statements about how technology should be included, that everything should be digital. We are in a digital age, digital records are available, or at least should be available. And therefore, as far as Dame Judith was concerned, and it's been accepted by the government, prescribed information should be available in a digital form. And therefore, it's really important that we understand that that as far as we're concerned, technology is going to be at the heart of that whole process. Now, the government's response to Dame Judith's requirements or recommendations is really split into these various layers. We've got the regulatory layer, where, as I said, we've got the new regulator, we've got new regulations, we've got new mandatory requirements, we've got that new CDM regime, those three gateways, and we've got the regulator taking control effectively of building control. We've also got uh, another other layer in respect of accountability. So in addition to the responsible person under the regulator reform fire safety order, we've now got the new principal accountable person or accountable persons, effectively the building owners, as well as the building safety manager role. And there's some very, very clear responsibilities that I'd like to go through in a, in a few moments. But there's also very clearly a need to transfer mandatory information between those um, those parties and other parties as well, uh, which has, has basically affected the CDM requirements. That information has to be held, has to be stored, has to be maintained and transferred or exchanged um, where it's required. Um, and that's got to be undertaken on a digital basis. Now, that will have to be passed not only to the regulator, but also residents, enforcers and other persons as well. And then, of course, we've got technology as the layer. So new, certainly very, very new requirements in respect of the provision and, and the use of certain digital systems for that management of uh, the information and with the whole aim of a digital first approach. And there's a lot of organizations that have got digital systems in place. But one of the questions I will be posing today is, have we got the right ones there? Are we therefore ready for what? the actual regulations or the act or bill will ultimately require. The last three layers, as, as we like to call it, are all about defensibility. So there are new sanctions uh, that I just really want to touch on very late on in the presentation. And then of course, there's uh, issues in respect of competence throughout the whole of the industry and governance. And I don't want to spend too much time on those particular areas today. Governance and consent and connivance means that effectively organizations have got to have in place fire safety management systems and systems that actually allow them to actually uh, protect themselves um, as well as the residents as well. But today, the very focus is all about technology. That digital first approach to the safety and, and management and engagement. So why is technology so pivotal? The, the reason is very, very simple. When you go through the act and you have a look at it and you look at the roles and responsibilities for the accountable persons, effectively, the accountable person has got to be able to prove compliance. Got to be able to prove compliance, not only to the regulator, but to others as well. And the only way we can see doing that is to use systems that will actually monitor their approach to, A, is the building safety manager actually doing his job? For example, are they actually interacting with the regulator in the right way? Are they obtaining and holding all of the required information, uh, the golden thread information, and therefore transferring that information to all of the various stakeholders? They will also have a day-to-day -day requirement to manage risk. One of the important areas of, of the bill is that Accountable persons have got to be able to prove to the regulator that they've got plans in place and that they are managing those risks that come out of any type of risk assessment process. So being able to show that you have 
manage them. According to the bill, you have to manage them promptly. There is no definition of what prompt is, but certainly you're going to have to be able to prove that you've done something promptly. Uh, so therefore, that day to day risk management approach is going to be really, really important. And in addition, you've got that day to day management of, of information and that sharing, as well as that governance approach of how well are we doing? Uh, because boards are going to have a much bigger role to play in the new processes. Now, of course, information doesn't just start with the accountable person. It starts with those who are designing, building and, and developing brand new properties. And so they are going to have to make sure that they provide that information in a digital format through the various gateways, those three gateways approaches, and effectively start that golden thread of, of digital information and deliver them through the various what we call fire information exchange points. More on that uh, later. So that digital information will have to be made available to the accountable person or when the accountable person takes over responsibility of that property. That was going to form a really important part of the golden thread. Now, of course, we've got the regulator involved. So the regulator is going to be receiving information and exchanging information. And again, the bill has made it very clear. It has to be digital. So we are going to have to provide digital information to the regulator. Very interestingly, already we are seeing various fire authorities asking, actually in many instances, insisting that accountable persons now provide them with digital versions of plans, digital versions of the fire risk assessments, etc., because they want them for their particular processes. So already we are seeing the regulatory bodies out there already asking for, as I say, in many instances, insisting that that information is provided in a digital form. The new role of the building safety manager has got some very important elements that he's got to think about. Um, so he will be responsible generally for maintaining that safety case that we mentioned earlier, uh, making sure that the risks are effectively managed and, and programmed. Um, anything that comes out of those or that particular action has got to be stored as part of that golden thread. The golden thread is not just about how the building was developed, it's how the building is then used, managed and maintained on a long term basis. He's also got, as I said, to be looking after the day to day risk management of, of that particular building, as well as dealing with what's now been called mandatory occurrence reporting, effectively uh, almost like a, a, a RIDOR version um, for fire safety and for residence safety. In addition, we've got residents, we've got to now make sure that residents have access to key information and residents themselves have got to be able to report issues. Uh, to the accountable person and the building safety manager um, in a very, very simple digital way. And then finally, managing agents, because managing agents also are going to play a significant role. They, they will continue probably to be the responsible persons or one of the responsible persons um, managing the risks on a day to day basis. And so therefore, that ongoing management and maintenance of the building is going to be a really important element. And of course, anything that comes out of that is going to again, form and continue to form that ongoing golden thread of information. So you can see already that technology is going to play a pivotal role in actually being or allowing all of the various stakeholders to be able to undertake and complete their roles. So in our opinion, it's very clear. Technology is the only way that the problem is going to be solved. That technology is going to be able to allow the accountable persons and other persons who are involved within the process to have that capability of being able to control that information. It's not just about having the information. You've got to be able to make sure that you know where it is, how it could be used, where it could be used. So therefore, you're able to then coordinate your role and cooperate with the various parties. And clearly, they've therefore got to be able to communicate all of that information in a digital form to the various parties. But we've got to do it effectively and we've got to do it efficiently. 
Now, very difficult to read, I would imagine, this slide, so my apologies, but what I've tried to do here is to set out the, the various responsibilities that are currently defined within the bill based around the uh, various types of accountable persons. So that's the principal accountable person, where you have, for example, more than one accountable person within a building, the various accountable persons themselves. So as you can see, there's around about 21 different areas of responsibility for principal and accountable persons. And then, of course, in respect of the building safety manager, the bill at the moment is very, very clear. They have set out one very clearly defined definition of what that building safety manager should be undertaking. So it's going to be down uh, in respect of the accountability uh, down to that accountable person to make sure that they provide the digital um, uh, function. They are able to actually be accountable. Um, and whilst they may be able to delegate actions to, to other parties, they can't delegate their accountability. So that accountable person and the principal accountable persons have got a huge amount of work that's got to be achieved in the next 18 months. And actually, I, I and we certainly are of the opinion that the only way that that can be achieved is by actually having a very, very clear digital platform that allows you to take that information, store it, and then use it and transfer it, exchange it in whatever way is actually needed. So the pathways to compliance then. And what I want to do is just very quickly have a look at, at how traditionally we've looked at the at compliance, because I think compliance, again, has got to be thought of in a different light. So we can take all of our various properties, the over 30 metres, the over 18 metres, the over 11 metres, even our mixed groups and, and those that are under 11 metres. And I would suggest that traditionally what people have been doing in respect of this is to look at the, the various design and construction and then fire safety, general safety, maintenance, and, and then ongoing management, very much in a silo. People have been looking at that and turn around and saying, yep, yeah, I've done my job, it's all done. I've done my job, it's all done. We've got our fire safety risk assessment, it's done. We've got our health and safety risk assessment, it's all done. We can put a tick in the box, turn around and say, we've done that particular part. What the bill is actually trying to force us down the line is to start thinking differently about what compliance is. Compliance is about safety, the safety of the residents, the safety of that building. So compliance has to go across, not just fire safety. The bill, as it stands at the moment, isn't just focused on fire safety. It's focused on building safety, including the structure. Now that in itself, can be changed um, by the, the Secretary of State. And there are rumours at the moment, certainly, that the, the bill could be amended to actually include other areas of concern, such as Legionella, asbestos. So don't be surprised if the final bill isn't just focused on fire and structure, but we see a much wider understanding of what compliance and building safety is. So that's the first element of how people probably have been doing and considering building safety and compliance in the past, but actually a need to change to is the building safe. In order to do that, according to the bill, there is a need for organisations, especially where they have more than one property, to actually think about this on a much more strategic basis. And so there's certainly a need to have building or portfolio strategies that consider building or fire safety. And in addition to that, the bill is very clear. The organizations that have more than one property, they start thinking about the fact that they're going to need some sort of building safety or fire safety management system. And again, based around what the, the, the basic requirements are of this digital first approach, in order to achieve that compliance, we only see the, the, the use of integrated software or technology systems going to be there to be able to support that pathway to compliance. So that is certainly the view that we've got 
on, on where the act is taking us. That it isn't just about um, how we can actually tick a little box to turn around and say, yep, I've done my design part. This is about making the building safe and making sure that organizations, accountable persons um, have in place, not just all of the documentation, but a view of how they're going to take that building further and in the future, make sure that the building continues to be safe for all of its occupants. So technology then for, for built assets is certainly gonna be about holding, storing and exchanging the prescribed information. And we'll go into that in a few moments in the prescribed digital form, but effectively makes the prescribed information available to residents, regulators, other accountable persons, the, the building safety manager and others. Um, so it's really important we start thinking about the different layers of, of information that we've got and the different layers of the audience. Uh, and that's why I put the, the onion up on, on the screen there. It's very simple. An onion has many layers. So there's going to be prescribed information that you would expect to be able to provide to a resident that you would not be providing to a regulator and likewise to the regulator that you wouldn't provide to the building safety manager. So we've got to think about not just holding and storing that data, but how that data is then managed, controlled, without affecting the security requirements of it. And of course, we've got that wonderful term GDPR. So we've got to start thinking a little differently about how we take that data, how we take that information, how we take those documents, and then use them and make them available for the various parties and stakeholders. So in our opinion, technology really should be aiming firstly to exploit, be exploited, so we can enable all of those developers and, de and designers to be able to exchange that information to the accountable person so that they can actually start and achieve that first part of that pathway to compliance. Now that's all well and good in a, a brand new building that's being built, but the vast majority of the, the properties that we know are going to be in the scope of the bill are going to be existing assets. So for us, it's about therefore the ability for the uh, accountable persons or principal accountable persons in being able to transfer and store and then manage control effectively that information to the various stakeholders efficiently and effectively. But again, having that right level of security and compliance. And, and the bill does actually provide us with a couple of areas where they've actually started talking about uh, copyright and security of information. But I think it's really important as well that we think about one of the major aims within technology, and that's about being able to deliver this single version of the truth. And that effectively is what the golden thread of information is about. It's about what is the single version of the truth for that particular building or that particular asset. And that for us are the aims of what of how technology should be uh, being used and exploited to actually support all of the individuals that are actually in the, 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 the new regime. So why now? Why should we be talking about technology now? Well, I think all of us will, will recognize and know how difficult it can be to, to take IT, new IT systems within, within any organization. Um, they're not the easiest to implement, let's be, be brutally honest. Procurement can be very long, can be very protracted. Um, we can see sometimes that procurement, uh, especially in, in certain organizations, has taken, for example, over 18 months to actually uh, get through. The shortest that we've seen it is probably about two to three months. Um, uh, but they are the smaller organizations, the more agile organizations, uh, and so, so certainly Procurement can be extremely long and protracted. One of the other elements that we've seen is that there have traditionally been some significant failures in, in how you manage risk. Uh, and that again, sometimes those more protracted procurement processes uh, and implementation processes have a tendency to forget about the risks associated. So we need to be able to deal with them now. And we've got to make sure that all of the stakeholders are fully engaged. 
that uh, they have access that they need through that procurement process and implementation process. So effectively, what we're suggesting is that you've got some choices to make. Um, as, as Rosalind mentioned uh, in her introduction, it may be that you've got systems already in place. So one of the things that we would suggest you need to start thinking about is, are they suitable and sufficient to do their job? And are they going to be able to scale with the new requirements? So how far do you go? and How far do you want that particular system to go? I think one of the other elements as well is that uh, interoperability and integration um, is going to be key. Um, there's far too much double entry uh, of information and data um, across the, the whole of our industry with multiple systems being used. And, and we're certainly of the belief that there needs to be a much more open, a much more freer approach to prop tech. And, and for us, innovation is a two way partnership. Um, Innovation is often in, in procurement documents and it, it's, it's, it's mentioned, but it's never really defined. For us, procurement needs both us to be the, the, the system of choice, but for the client to be the, the customer of choice. Because the more that we have interaction between the two parties, the better innovation can be. So again, it's not just about what system do we need? It's about how you use that system, how you grow that system, and how we innovate for what will be a, a, a very difficult time for many uh, over the next certainly two to three years. So let's quickly put a, a timetable, at least a timetable that we believe uh, to be true. Certainly, the, the government have made it very clear that they would like to have Royal Assent before October 2022. So a year's time, we should have the act in place and, and, and available. That it's expected between that October and May period that we are going to see some transition, some brand new regulation. The, the act or the bill itself is an enabling act. So it requires some additional regulations for certain parts to be um, commenced. And so therefore we are expecting commencement on, on the vast majority of, of the areas to be in round about May, 2023. So time in respect to technology is really not a luxury for us. We've got to start thinking about what we are doing now. It's very easy, isn't it? If you need a fire risk assessment, you can go out and get a fire risk assessment undertaken probably in a couple of weeks. You go and procure someone to do your fire risk assessment and, and get them out on site and it's done. Technology takes a lot longer. And therefore we would certainly suggest that you need to start thinking about technology at a much earlier date. So we've, we've heard a lot about what the golden thread is and, um, and this information effectively all forms that, that golden thread. Now the government have actually now told us what they believe the golden thread is going to be. It's information that allows um, all of the parties to understand how a particular building or asset um, has been constructed uh, and as well as the steps that are going to be needed to keep both the building um, in the condition it needs to be in and clearly the people are safe both now and in the future but I think what's been very interesting is that the the government have been very clear that they don't believe that regulation is going to be enough to deliver what they like to call this fundamental reform. They have made it very clear that industry has got to want to do this, um, has got to see the need to do this. I think there's been so much talk about the golden thread and about what it is and, and what it isn't. We see it all the time that, that many believe the golden thread is about how the building is being managed now. Um, and others believe that the golden thread is about how the building was designed. F for us, we like to think of it in a different light. It's about the provenance of that building to where or the date that you are at now. How did the building get to where it is now? How is, did that building be designed? How are the systems interacting with each other? So that provenance of the building is really what for us is the golden thread. And for us, it's the technology solution that you adopt that will help you deliver that reform and be able to prove to the government that we, they don't need to, to use another stick 
that uh, the carrot has been accepted and that we are taking that technology solution and we are delivering that reform without having to have additional burdens of regulation. Because let's, let's be very clear, the government have made it clear, if, if, if we don't act as an industry, they will. Um, the court of public opinion is, especially on this subject, is, is very, very vocal. Um, and, and I would not suggest that uh, waiting to see what's going to happen is probably going to not be the best uh, approach. So what do we think that you should be doing? Certainly, first things first, gathering this information, I would suggest you need to determine how you're going to store that information. Where are you going to put, all, put it all and how are you going to manage it? So it's about identifying all of that and it's making sure that you can identify what's available and what you are required to do. So you're also going to need to think about who's got that information. I would suggest then you start need to start gathering that data, determining what tools and processes that you need to, to gather that information and then start to actually get the information and store it. Then we've got to start thinking about how you codify that information, whether you're going to start thinking about naming conventions. Um, there's been a lot of talk about BIM and obviously the BIM uh, systems have a, a very specific naming convention. We've got a brand new code of practice that's coming out in the, in the, few, in the next few weeks called BS 8644 part one, which is going to propose how we deal with the golden thread and technology. And then, of course, we've got the government and others really pushing the unique property reference number system. So we've got to start thinking about how we codify that data, then managing that information and how we can deliver that secure storage of that information through the various exchange points and then make sure that we can distribute that information to all of the various stakeholders so they have the right information at the right time. So. Let's think about uh, the new assets element, because I know that many of you obviously are developers uh, as well as owners. So we've got this new code, as I said, 8644, that's due for final publication. We believe this year, certainly uh, December, we were told that it's, it should be in place. Now, the new code and the model I've put on the screen there is, is from the original draft. So that may change slightly. But as you can see, it focuses very much on, on the new build side. Um, it's all about brief, design, construction, um, and it really sets out what good is supposed to look like. It complements the, the current UK BIM framework, but as you can see, it also complements the use of the RIBA plan of work process. So that's very much um, how that transfer of information should be managed. And what it does, it actually bases the, the system on some very, very key fire safety objectives, be them compliance with statutory requirements, environmental requirements, uh, and other elements as well, but based around very, very succinct five asset lifecycle phases with what they call six exchange points or information exchange points. So that's how the, the new code of practice is going to be suggesting that organizations take that digital data and, and exchange and manage it through that build through to handover and operation process. Now, what I've done is I've extracted all of that information to actually look at what the scale is. Uh, and this is just a selection. There's probably a, a significant number of additional um, pieces of, of, of information that's required. And it starts off with the brief, the design and construction. And again, that's, that's great. Then it's about handover. And, and from our experience, what we've seen is that there certainly has been a major issue in respect of how information is then handed over to the, the, um, the accountable persons and then handed over to the managers. We then also got to think about how the building is obviously in use. Now, it's very clear, if you look at it, you can build the information, your golden thread, as you go through that process. Um, and it's relatively simple. You start off effectively with a blank sheet and you're going to build that process, but take an existing asset. You're starting off with in use. Effectively, our opinion is that you need to start thinking about reverse engineering, 
taking the information that you can get, that you have, and building and then working back, because that's the only way you're going to be able to build that golden thread. And there are going to be blocks. There are going to be roadblocks. There are going to be dams, which you will not be able to get past. Organizations may not be available, may not be in, in business anymore. The information that they used to hold or held is not going to be available. So it's better if we start with what you do have and work your way back. But technology is going to be the key here. How do you store all of this information? We've gone and had a look at this in a slightly different way again. Um, we've got a, a spreadsheet that we've just recently done, for example, that suggests that if, for example, the, the bill was to be extended to other areas, we could be looking at over 190 various um, documents that you could be looking at. And if you can imagine, many of those are based around things such as lifts, and those lifts are going to have multiple assets within certain buildings. So the existing built asset, we could be looking at, as I say, a significant amount of data that's required to be held, stored and exchanged. That golden thread of information then in respect of the, uh, the that new code effectively sets out these information exchange points very much based around the, the Kobe system, very similar approach. What they have suggested is that this doesn't have to be a BIM related system that this can in fact be a different type of system, a spreadsheet, XML. It's got to be proportional to the building and the asset. It's got to be proportional as well to what's actually held and stored. And as I said, it does not have to be graphical. Uh, it does not have to be BIM. It does not have to be a 3D model. The systems that they're talking about here is about the ability to store information and that data. So. The type of information we're thinking about, this single version of the truth, is all about building that safety case. And effectively, all of the other information is producing that, that single version of the truth. That's got to be stored in some sort of information storage or, or management solution. That information as well has got to therefore be available to the principal and accountable persons. And those accountable persons have a duty to actually make it that information available, depending upon that layer, to the residents, the managing agents, the regulator, and as well as the building safety manager. But of course, we need to think about integration with other systems as well. So certainly information technology is gonna be key to actually delivering that single version of the truth. I think one of the things that we wanna talk about as well is, is that the difficulty in the industry about all of the various systems that are being used. So we talked about the fact that there's going to be a need for risk compliance and management systems, document information systems, and of course, this mandatory occurrence reporting. And that could be held in a, a single uh, platform, or you may have your own three platforms that deal with that. We've also got property and accounting management. So in the respect of the building safety charge, you're going to have to have transparency in respect of that. You're going to have supply chain managers who provide you with information digitally through uh, various portals you've got works management systems you've got systems that for example deal with uh, facilities and CAFM. you've got uh, smart buildings and of course you've got insurance but as i said you've also got uh, bim systems that could be in use and then of course we've got emails as well and emails again will play a vital role especially if anyone's listened to the grenfell tower inquiry you'll know how important emails are. Effectively, it's about providing all of that information to the various parties, and then of course, to those external parties as well. And the vast majority of this is gonna be held in the cloud. So for us, whilst this is perhaps a, a utopian view, this is certainly where we see this is going forward with all of that information aggregated into a, a single actionable reporting wrap. As I said, time is not a luxury. We know what's happening, but it's really about what does compliance mean for you after that particular date? And that's certainly the areas that we are suggesting that you need to be focusing on, and that is getting technology in place at a, as early a stage as possible. I'm very close to, to finishing. Um, just really want to turn around and say, I don't want to scare anybody here, but let's just be very honest with everybody. There are new sanctions. There are new requirements. 
If, for example, you, you don't do what the regulator requires, then that regulator may take the building into special measures. That will mean them taking control of the data, taking control of the charges, engagement with the, with the managers and day-to-day -day risk management as well. And then, of course, the other element is, which is interesting is what do we do if we wait and we don't get ourselves in place and we are effectively consenting or conniving um, that effectively means that we are uh, breaking the requirements of the, of the Act. It's very clear that if that is considered, um, then it's the person as well as the body corporate that actually is seen to be committing the offence and is liable to be proceeded against and those prosecutions, if on indictment, could lead to imprisonment of up to two years and or an unlimited fine. So, just really want to finish here then. We've got three things that we would suggest that uh, you really do need to start thinking about in respect to the bill. Yep, you're clearly going to be looking at building safety managers and all of the other elements. But in respect of technology, certainly we would suggest that first thing you do is undertake a very quick audit really create that gap analysis to determine what technology that you currently have and what technology you believe you will require in the long term to make sure that you are ready to start and also continue with that building safety and compliance elements surrounding the building safety determine what information you have who has it where is it determine who's actually responsible who's accountable for it and obviously then determine what activities you believe you need to take so you can complete that pathway to compliance. And that, that could be the fact that you should be thinking about the safety case, your other management systems, but you need to think about technology. You need to therefore, once you've got that, uh, that gap analysis, devise that short-term plan so you can address the building safety bill gaps. Think about the technology solutions, integration, think about the resources and we're not just talking about human resources here there's financial resources as well um, you've got to think about security and obviously the changes to the organization and then ultimately implement that by plugging those gaps be it technology information etc that's really all I, I wanted to be able to, to take you through today um, i'm very conscious of the time thank you very much um, and, and over to you ian thank you very much david that's um a great start to, to our, our journey through the next um, six webinars. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, um, obviously of the view that um, we're going to dig, dig, dig deeper into some of that um, as we get into uh, the various webinars. Um, what, what we wanted to do now was to, to have a poll um, so that we can see where uh, people's priorities are. And uh, if I can ask my colleague, uh, Michelle, to, to conjure that up. Um, We've got 19 questions at the moment, and um, I'm a stickler for finishing these things on time, uh, conscious that people have other calls to hop on to. So uh, we will, I think um, uh, I'll set out what we're going to do next, um, but um, ask the, uh, the audience if they could uh, uh, fill in the, the poll questions that are in front of them. And uh, if you feel we're missing a trick, if there are particular topics that are not on that uh, that list, then then please um, put those in the Q and A as well, and we'll pick pick those up. Um, I think from here, then, and, and there's a couple of questions I can sort of answer in terms of administrative um, uh, issues. Um, as I said at the start, we will will make um, uh, this uh, webinar uh, recording available um, after the event. Uh, the way that we normally do that is to uh, post it on our past events uh, part of our website um, and at that point we normally alert uh, the delegates who've attended the webinar to uh, to the fact that it's now up. Um, I suggest given the number of questions that we have that we do some sort of um, written compendium and uh, um, answer them that way. Um, there, there was one um, perhaps that um, uh, David and Rosalind could answer, which um, occurred first and is a sort of more of a sort of conceptual question, which is, you know, do, does the bill just apply to residential or, or are there any implications for, for, for commercial property? So um, perhaps you could answer that one and uh, whilst we wait for the, the poll results to pop up from, from Michelle. 
Yeah, certainly. I, th I think it's very, very clear that um, you know any building that contains a, a residential um, uh, uh, apartment. So we could have mixed buildings um, that will be covered by the bill as it stands at the moment. But we, it is very much at the moment focusing on uh, residential blocks. But I, I think we've got to start thinking about uh, the fact that, that the government may decide at a later date, or the Secretary of State may decide at a later date to extend the scope uh, or extend the, the application of the bill. Um, and there are already views that, um, that they're going to be taking a very much more um, uh, a long term view about extending this out into other residential style properties, institutional um, hotels, for example, uh, prisons, al although clearly we don't want means of escape from prisons, but um, that's a, a different matter. But in addition to that, there is talk about it extending out into to other various types of uh, commercial properties as well. That is a possibility. I think as well, it's very clear that we are seeing um, that those who manage commercial properties are already thinking about this process and have already decided that they don't, they're not interested in uh, a two tier system, that they're very much focused on, on delivering a consistent approach across all of their properties. So very, very much um, we are seeing organizations take this process and, and the regime and apply it to commercial properties as far as they can. Thank you, David. And uh, uh, the poll is um, yeah, giving us a good steer, I think. Uh, the building safety manager um, comes out top, um, but the, the top, seat, uh, top three subjects, accountable person and golden thread also uh, scoring highly. So um, yeah, for future events, I think the, the, the plan is also that we will mix around the format a bit, um, maybe panels rather than a presentation. And um, we certainly want to consider doing at least uh, one or two of those, um, perhaps as a hybrid or um, as um, a face-to-face -face event rather than a rather than a webinar. But uh, we'll we'll put all of that in a note to delegates after this event, um, and uh, already starting to plan num number two. So um, build the building safety manager looks like a um, a vote a vote winner. Um, before we conclude, um, I, I think Rosalind had wanted to say a few few remarks just to to, to summarise and uh, thank you um, um, from my perspective for an excellent presentation today. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Thank you David. That was really really interesting. Um, it's clear to to us that technology is going to play a pivotal role in our ability to comply with regulations. I think what's really really key from this, it's not just about the golden thread. It's about these new account this new accountable era. It's about these uh, new, new individuals who've got to control, coordinate, uh, communicate, and, and uh, achieve collaboration with all the different stakeholders. Um, and you know, it's clear to me that without technology, this is pretty much going to be impossible. Um, we also uh, see uh, technology as a, a chance to uh, allow uh, APs and building safety managers and all the various different uh, uh, stakeholders to actually justify. I think this is an area of justification, uh, which is really, really important. Um, and finally, um, uh, you know, we know that how long uh, technology takes to procure. And uh, we know that the defining and um, the, the procurement process and not to mention the implementation. So I think that starting now, I think the message is quite clear. We start now 18 months isn't too far away. Um, and what we've also got to do is um, also see um, how uh, we're going to get to that point of um, pathways to compliance um, and how technology is going to be able to provide um, uh, and support that, that whole entire journey. Um, so, so very, very importantly, I'm sure there's loads of questions that everyone has, uh, so, so much more. We're very happy to support uh, everyone who's, who's attended uh, and we're going to be um, sending out um, uh, a communication with the British Property Federation um, to see how we can support you further, because um, I'm sure lots of questions have been raised uh, and, and thoughts uh, from this uh, session. Um, we've nearly had 500 people registering for this event, so obviously I appreciate there's going to be loads of questions, so we'll be supporting that too. And I just want to say uh, to, to Ian, Fletcher and the team, thank you so much for, uh, 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 for this. 
Um, it's been really, really great for coordinating this this event. And uh, thank you very much, David. That was thank absolutely you. fantastic. Thank you both. And uh, one, one, one final question that um, I don't really want to answer on, online, but um, uh, Rob, I think, had asked at the start of the presentation if he could be put in touch with, with Marcus Phillips, the, the chair of our sounding board. And uh, if Rob wants to drop me an email, ifletcher at bpf.org.uk, I'll, I'll happily do that. Uh, uh, but I won't do that on the, uh, the Q&A uh, session, section. Um, I said, look, look out for an email um, coming your way um, with both the instructions to the recording and uh, also our responses to, to the Q&A. Um, lots of issues there around um, everything from insurance to uh, technical platforms um, to uh, some, some of the uh, uh, sort of data sharing protocols, et cetera. So a um, lot, lot of um, uh, issues for us to tackle and come back to you on. Um, Thank you. It just leaves me to, to say thank you very much for uh, to, to Rosalind and David for their, their excellent input today and to uh, our delegates for attending. I think we had about 240 at peak. So uh, great to be able to, to come to you and present, uh, present today. Thank you very much and enjoy your day, everybody.